Welcome to the trainings unit, One Way Innova. This training unit deals with ball bearings for skateboard wheels, used by Smartboard Company. An important criterion for the fit, is the outer diameter of the ball bearings. Smartboard Company is looking for three new ball bearing suppliers for this purpose, as the previous suppliers were not able to meet the high reproducibility, required by Smartboard Company. This means that the previous suppliers were not able to deliver ball bearings with identical outer diameters to Smartboard Company. The three ball bearing manufacturers, John, Rodney, and Mullen, emerged from supplier discussions as potential future suppliers. All three suppliers manufacture the ball bearings according to the exact same manufacturing process, have the same machines, and also purchase the raw materials required for ball bearing production uniformly from one raw material supplier. Before these three ball bearing suppliers are to be permanently contracted, a supplier benchmark is to be used to check whether the suppliers have a high reproducibility, that is whether all three suppliers are able to supply Smartboard Company with the same qualities in terms of the outer diameters of the ball bearings. For this reason, we are to perform a supplier benchmark based on representative samples randomly drawn from the productions of the three ball bearing manufacturers. The outer diameters of the ball bearings from the random samples are then to be measured in the Smartboard Company Measuring Laboratory, with the help of a calibrated and validated measuring system. The focus of the benchmark and thus also of this training unit is the question of whether or not specifically the outer diameters of the ball bearings of the suppliers, John, Rodney, and Mullen differ significantly from each other. For the benchmark, Smartboard Company has given the three suppliers the specific customer requirement, that the outer diameter must reach the target value of 22.0 millimeters as well as possible. The required sample sizes for a sample power of 80% were determined upfront and are set at 30 individual values per sample, which would result in a total of 90 ball bearings. Upfront, the data were also tested positive for normal distribution. However, for didactic reasons, at this point we will not continue to work with 30 individual values, but only with 5 individual values per sample so that we will only work with 15 values. The reason for this is that with only 15 individual values, we can recalculate the parameters resulting from the analysis of variance, step by step. With 90 single values, the calculation steps would only be sextupled, without any didactic added value. Let us take a look at the three samples, by importing the dataset benchmark ball bearing suppliers with open file. In the worksheet, we can see the three sample sets, that have been randomly drawn from the production of the respective ball bearing manufacturer. Next, we receive an overview of the center and distribution parameters of our three samples by clicking on statistics, basic statistics, and then on display descriptive statistics. Then select our three samples and confirm with OK. We then see in our output window that the mean values of the three sample sets are as follows. The mean diameter in the sample of the ball bearing manufacturer John is 22.02 millimeters, with a standard deviation of 0.04 millimeters. The mean diameter in the Rodney sample is 21.98 millimeters, with a standard deviation of 0.0316 millimeters. And the mean diameter in the Mullen sample is 22.06 millimeters, with a standard deviation of 0.0316 millimeters. Our aim is now to find out whether these three mean differences represent significant differences with regard to the respective production populations, or not. Since so far, we have only ever dealt with a maximum of two sample sets that we compared with each other, at this point we will not get any further with the classic t-test for two samples. In such cases, where more than two mean values have to be compared, the so-called analysis of variance, ANOVA, is the right choice. The analysis of variance is therefore also the main topic of this training unit. In order to get to know the analysis of variance, we directly start with our data in the analysis of variance by proceeding as follows. We click on statistics, analysis of variance ANOVA. And since we want to find out whether the means of these three samples differ significantly, we chose the option one-way analysis of variance. Our three data sets are each in a separate column and we therefore select the option response data are in a separate column for each factor level and we transfer our three factor levels to the responses input field. At this point, there is also the option to activate a number of different diagrams and graphics. The standard setting is sufficient for us at first, and we confirm our entries with OK, and look at the result of the variance analysis in our output window. Under the heading method, 
we see the defined null hypothesis, which postulates that all mean values are equal. The alternative hypothesis postulates that not all mean values are equal. In plain language, the alternative hypothesis assumes that at least two suppliers differ significantly in their outer diameters. Under the heading factor information, we find the information that we have one factor, in our case this would be the factor ball bearing supplier. And we see that this factor ball bearing supplier is presented in three different levels, namely John, Rodney, and Mullen. These are our so-called factor levels. For this reason, we have also chosen the one-factor analysis of variance, which is simply called one-way ANOVA, in contrast to the multiple ANOVA, where several factors are given. Such analyses of variance we will get to know in detail in separate training sessions. Next, we will look at the important key figures in the analysis of variance. Here, we should first of all, focus on our p-value, which basically represents the result of our analysis of variance. In this case the p-value is 0.011, and therefore below the defined error probability of 0.05. We will learn how this p-value came about, in the course of this training session. However, we can already say, that since the p-value is less than 0.05, we correctly reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis, which says, that at least two ball-bearing manufacturers differ significantly, in their mean ball-bearing outer diameters. And now, to the main variables from the analysis of variance, which are essential in order to determine the p-value. Let us start with the degrees of freedom DF. Degrees of freedom are abbreviated with the acronym DF. We remember that we have three sample sets, each with a range of five individual values. So that a total of three times five equals 15 individual values result. And therefore, the number of degrees of freedom is also 15, in order to mathematically describe our total scatter with the variance model. Since, in principle, one degree of freedom is always bound by the description of the mean value, the actual number of degrees of freedom is correctly reduced to 15, minus 1, equals 14 degrees of freedom, in order to mathematically describe, the total scatter with our variance analysis. This value is again found at this point. These 14 degrees of freedom, are now distributed to the following two scatter components, as follows. Two degrees of freedom are needed for the source factor, in order to statistically describe the corresponding three-factor levels, to each other. And 12 degrees of freedom are needed to describe the source, random scatter, which basically represents the classical part-to-part -part scatter within the factor levels. And at this point is described by the term, error. In statistics, total scatter is also called, adjusted sum of squares total. It therefore consists of the following two sources of scatter. On the one hand, the variance between the three-factor levels, this scatter portion is called adjusted sum of square, factor. And on the other hand, the variance within the respective factor level, which is accordingly designated as adjusted sum of square, error. Expressed in plain language with concrete numbers, the total scatter, adjusted sum of square, total, at 0 0.0304, is composed as follows. 0 0.016 parts of the total scatter, are due to the source factor, and are designated as adjusted sum of square factor. The remaining 0.0144 parts of the total scatter, are due to the source, error. That is the part-to-part -part scatter, within the factor levels, and are designated as adjusted sum of square error. To compare the two scatter components, we have to normalize our two, adjusted sum of square values, by dividing our, adjusted sum of square values, by their respective number of degrees of freedom. And we then basically obtain the respective average estimates for our two scatter components. These average estimates, for our two scatter components are called the adjusted mean square, factor, and adjusted mean square, error, respectively. They are a measure for the scatter behavior of the data within the factor levels and between the factor levels. We divide 0.016 by 2, which results in an adjusted mean square, factor value of 0.008. And we divide 0.0144 by 12 degrees of freedom, resulting in an adjusted mean square, error value, of 0.0012. In plain text, the adjusted mean square factor value of 0.008 is a measure to describe the variance between the three factor levels. And the adjusted mean square error value of 0.0012 is a measure to describe the variance within the respective three factor levels. This relationship between these two adjusted mean square values is decisive in determining whether the scatter we found in our three sample sets using descriptive statistics 
is actually due to the different manufacturers, or only to random scatter. Thus, we only need to form the ratio, by dividing the estimated value of the variance between the factor levels, by the estimated value of the variance within our factor levels. So we divide 0.008 by 0.0012, and receive a ratio, of the scatter between the factor levels, to the scatter within the factor levels, of 6.67. And this ratio is the so-called F value, which we also see here. In order to better understand the main variance parameters F value, adjusted mean square value and adjusted sum of squares value, we derive these ratios step by step, with the help of our deliberately reduced sample size. Let us briefly summarize the initial situation. We have one factor available, namely the influencing factor ball bearing suppliers in general. We have three levels, of factors available, namely John, Rodney, and Mullen. And a representative sample, of five ball bearings, each was randomly drawn from the current production of supplier, John, Rodney, and Mullen. Subsequently, the outer diameters of each of the three suppliers, were measured with a valid measuring system, resulting in a total of 15 individual values. And now we have to distinguish, two cases at this point. Assuming our individual values of the three suppliers would be available, as follows with regard to scatter and mean value. Then we see, that there is a high scatter behavior within, the suppliers. And the three mean values are very similar to each other, in comparison, because they are very close to each other. So in this case, the variances, within the three factor levels would be high, and the variance between the factor levels would be, low. If this were the case, then we can draw the conclusion, that differences in the mean values cannot be, explained by different parameter settings in the manufacturing process of the ball bearings, but are due, to the classical part-to-part -part dispersion, that every production process has. The situation would be different, if the location and scatter parameters, would behave in such a way that there would be a very low scatter within the manufacturer samples, and that the three mean values would be significantly far apart, in comparison to each other. In this the second case, the variances within the factor levels, would be low, and the variance between the factor levels, would be high. If this were the case, then we may draw the conclusion, that the part-to-part -part variance, that is the process variance, is very low with all three suppliers, which would always be desirable. But due to the differences in the mean values, it can be assumed that the cause of the mean value differences is based on the fact that the three ball bearing manufacturers obviously use significantly different process methods for the production of ball bearings. And that is already the basic principle and the approach in a one-way ANOVA. In order to get a statement about whether the three different determined mean values are due to the different factor levels or whether it is a random scatter, which is due to the part-to-part -part scatter within a factor level. To better understand the one-way ANOVA, we perform the analysis of variance manually, using our concrete numerical values. Basically, the analysis of variance is performed in, five steps. Step 1. In the first step, we have to determine the respective mean value for each supplier, that is for each factor level. We do this, by adding up the respective individual values, and then dividing them, by the number of individual values. Thus, the respective sample mean values in the three factor levels, John, Rodney, and Mullen are 22.02, 21.98, and 22.06 millimeters. Step 2. In the second step, we need the total mean value, which is the arithmetic mean value over all 15 individual values. This is also determined in the classic way, in which we add up all 15 individual values, and divide them by the number of individual values, that is by 15, which gives a total mean value of, 22.02 millimeters. Step 3. In the third step, we must then determine the variances, within, the factor levels. This means, the variances, within, the manufacturer samples. To do this, we have to determine the sum of the differences, in each factor level, by forming, and squaring, the difference, between the respective measured values, and the respective factor level mean value, and adding up the squared differences. And divide the result, by the number of degrees of freedom. In plain text, we take the first individual value of 22.06 millimeters from the first factor level and subtract the factor level mean of 22.02 millimeters from this value and square this difference. We do the same for the second, third, fourth, etc. individual value until all 15 square differences are formed in this way. Add up all square differences and then divide by the number of degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom are there in our case? 
For the variance within the factor levels, the degree of freedom corresponds to the sum of all single values, thus 15, minus the calculated number of mean values, thus 3. Thus, in our case there are 15, minus 3, equals 12, degrees of freedom. This value of degrees of freedom can also be found in our output window at this point. So we divide our sum of squared differences by a number of degrees of freedom of 12, which results in a mean square sum within the factor levels of 0.0012. There are different abbreviations for this. In most statistics software, the abbreviation adjusted MS error is used for the sum of the adjusted mean squares within the factor levels. We find this value of 0.0012 also in our output window at this point. Thus, the variance parameter adjusted MS is a measure for the variances within the factor levels. Step 4. In the fourth step, we need a variance parameter for the variance between the factor levels. For this, we calculate the difference between the mean values of the individual levels and the total mean value squared. Multiply the result by the number of individual values in the respective factor levels. And divide the result, again by the number of the corresponding degrees of freedom. In plain text, we subtract the total mean value of 22.02 mm from the first factor mean value of 20.02 mm. Square the result. And multiply that by the number of individual values in this factor level. In this case, multiplying by 5. We do the same for the second factor mean and the third factor mean. And then divide the whole thing by the number of degrees of freedom. In this case, we get the number of degrees of freedom from the original 3 degrees of freedom resulting from the 3 factor averages. But subtract 1 degree of freedom, because it is bound by the total mean. Thus in this case, the number of degrees of freedom is 3, minus 1, equals 2. This number of degrees of freedom, can also be found in our output window at this point. Divide our result by 2, which gives us a value for the variance, between the factor levels of 0.008 and this mean square sum of the variances between the factor levels is abbreviated with adjusted MS factor. We find this value in our output window at this point. Step 5. In the fifth and last step, we only have to bring the variance between the factor levels into relation to the variance within the factor levels. That is, divide adjusted MS factor by adjusted MS error, which will give us the important F value. In concrete numbers, this is 0.008, divided by 0.0012, which gives us a ratio of 6.67. And this ratio is the so-called F value. The index F is a reference to the mathematician Ronald Fisher, who performed a lot of pioneering work in this statistic field. And so we worked our way along this detailed path to the point in the output window where we had also arrived, computer-based. We should have now gained a better understanding of these variance components, which at first glance appear relatively abstract. And in summary, we can already say at this point, that it is possible to express only with this F value, how the ratio of the variances, between factor levels is, in relation to the variances, within the factor levels. The mathematical density function, which can be used to map this ratio mathematically, is also named after its developer Fisher, and is simply called, the F distribution. The F distribution is characterized by only two parameters the number of degrees of freedom in the numerator, and the number of degrees of freedom in the denominator. A prerequisite for this is that the data are normally distributed. Let us take a look at the F distribution by clicking on graph, probability distribution plot, selecting the option view probability and confirming with OK. Selecting our F distribution from the distribution drop-down menu. And we see at this point, as already mentioned, that we only need two parameters to construct our F distribution. DF stands for degrees of freedom and shows the number of degrees of freedom. And these are the degrees of freedom we needed to determine the variances within and between the factor levels. As we have learned, the numerator contains the estimated value of the variance between the factor levels. And as we have learned, the denominator contains the estimated value of the variances within the factor levels. In our practical scenario, the numerator thus contains 3, minus 1, equals 2 degrees of freedom. And the denominator 15, minus 3, equals 12 degrees of freedom. The respective number of degrees of freedom can also be read directly in our output window. Thus, we enter the value 2 for the number of degrees of freedom in the numerator, 
and a value 12 for the number of degrees of freedom in the denominator, and confirm our entries with OK. In our output window, we get the desired distribution diagram for an F distribution, with 2 degrees of freedom in the numerator and 12 degrees of freedom in the denominator. And as we learned from the basics of statistics, the area below a density function describes the probability, for the occurrence of a variable, and the total area corresponds to, 100%. The area marked in red from an F value of 3.885, characterizes 5% of the total area. And the remaining white area, represents 95% probability mass. And we can now also graphically determine the p-value, for our f value of 6.67. By entering the last input window once again, with the shortcut key Control e and selecting in the Shades Area tab, the x-value option. And specifying an x-value of, 6.67, and confirming with OK. These probability values, can also be determined, without software support. For this purpose, there are corresponding tables for the F distribution, from which, if the number of degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator is known, the corresponding F value for a significance level of 0.05 for example can be read. In our case an F value of 6.67, thus results in a P value of 0.011, which we also have displayed next to the F value, in our output window. So we can see very well at this point, that the P value decreases, with increasing F value. And so we can also understand, that the larger the ratio variance between factor levels, to random variance is, the larger our F value becomes, and the smaller the P value becomes. This means, that if our null hypothesis were correct, then we would have to have an F value, that with a high probability, that is with 95%, lies in this white area, of our F distribution. And values greater than 6.67, are theoretically possible, but very unlikely. Thus, all values within the white area, describe the acceptance range of our null hypothesis, respectively all values within the red area, describe the rejection range of our null hypothesis. Therefore, with an F value of 6.67, or a P value of 0.011, we reject the null hypothesis according to the rules of the hypothesis test. And we can assume, with a 95% probability, that at least two ball bearing manufacturers, produce ball bearings that differ significantly, in their mean outer diameter. At this point it becomes clear once again, how important a sufficient sample size is, because the sample sizes decide on the number of the degrees of freedom. Because the more degrees of freedom we have left, to describe a variance model, the more accurate our, adjusted MS values, become. This is also generally understandable, if we realize once again, that the more individual values we have, that is the more information we can extract from our samples, the more precise our adjusted sum of squares estimates become, for the description of the variances within, and between the factor levels. And it then also becomes understandable, that if the proportion of variation, between suppliers were maximum in extreme cases, and the random variance is minimum, we would be forced, to move away from the null hypothesis, and assume that, there are significant differences, between the factor levels. If we look at the corresponding interval plot, then we can already see and assume, that the Rodney company produces the lowest mean ball bearing diameters. And thus differs significantly, from the supplier, with the highest mean ball bearing diameter, in this case, company Mullen. Whether the difference between company Rodney and John is significant, or whether the difference between company John, and company Mullen is significant, we will find out during this training session. More information can be found, under the heading, Model Summary. What is meant by model here, is basically our variance model, which statistically describes the total scatter on the basis of the individual values, and the degrees of freedom as a function of the random scatter, and the factor levels. The model parameters, listed here such as S, are squared, are squared adjusted, and are squared predicted, are important parameters, in the context of regression analysis. Or in connection with statistical design of experiments, which we will discuss in separate training sessions, in connection with the so-called, response optimization and will therefore only be briefly mentioned here. Therefore, the parameter R-squared, as a measure for the quality of our variance model, describes how well our mathematical model describes our real data. The value can be between 0 and 100%. The parameter R-squared adjusted is always important if our variance model is to describe several factors with several factor levels each. Or, if we want to compare variance models with different input variables, also called predictors. The parameter R-squared predicted, is an important measure, 
for the response optimization. In our practical scenario, the first step is to make a 95% reliable statement as to whether the three ball bearing manufacturers are currently able to produce uniform ball bearings that do not differ significantly in their outer diameters. Which ball bearing manufacturers differ significantly from each other is still an interesting question. For this, we click on Statistics, ANOVA, One Way ANOVA, and click on the button Comparisons. Leave the default setting of the error probability at 5%. And select the Fisher test as the comparison method. Under results, activate the options, interval plot for differences of means, grouping information, and tests. And confirm our inputs with OK. And look at the information in the output window under the heading, Fisher, pairwise comparisons. The comparison test works with so-called grouping letters, which are to be interpreted as follows. Identical grouping letters mean that the respective factor levels do not differ from each other. Unequal group letters on the other hand mean that the factors statistically differ significantly from each other. In this case, the supplier Mullen has the letter A. And supplier Rodney has in contrast the letter B. Thus, the mean ball bearing diameters of these two suppliers differ statistical significantly. The supplier John on the other hand has the letter A just like the supplier Mullen. The supplier John also has the letter B. This means that John does not differ statistical significantly from supplier Mullen, but also does not differ statistical significantly from supplier Rodney. The supplier John is therefore exactly in the middle between these two suppliers, which means that here we cannot see any statistical significant difference at the supplier John. Under Fisher individual tests for differences of mean, we see the results, which were basically determined on the basis of the simple t-test for two samples. Using the p-values we see that, that is the pairwise comparison between supplier Mullen and Rodney, resulted in a p-value below 0.05. This means that there are significant differences between these two suppliers. We had already noticed this with the different grouping letters. And we can also see from the p-values between supplier Rodney and supplier John, respectively Mullen, that there are p-values greater than 0.05. And here in each case no significant difference can be found. This is also in line with the findings that we had drawn from the identical grouping letters of these pairs. With these results, we can use the p-value to recommend to the management of Smartboard Company that there is a 95% probability that two of the three manufacturers differ significantly in their mean ball bearing diameters. And we can also say which manufacturers these are. There are significant differences between the suppliers Rodney and Mullen. In this case, it would be advisable in the first step to develop uniform process standards through discussions with the suppliers in order to improve the precision of comparison, especially between the suppliers Rodney and Mullen. Having reached the end of our training unit, let us briefly summarize the most important findings. In the past training sessions, we only had to deal with two samples at most, where the mean values were compared. In this practical scenario, for the first time three process mean values had to be compared. Three samples were available for this. With the help of descriptive statistics, we first of all, gained an overview of the center and scatter parameters of our three sample sets. Before entering the actual analysis of variance, ANOVA, and basically before starting any hypothesis test, in practice a discriminatory power analysis should actually always be performed in order to work with a sample size that provides a sufficient discriminatory sample power of at least 80%. This analysis should always be followed by a test for normal distribution. We have deliberately omitted these two steps in order to focus on the relatively complex analysis of variance, ANOVA. For didactic reasons, we have deliberately chosen a very small sample size in order to be able to understand and derive the relatively abstract variance parameters step by step. In order to compare the three mean values with each other, we got to know the so-called one factorial analysis of variance, which is often only called one-way ANOVA. With the help of the one factorial analysis of variance, we got to know the corresponding scatter components, which represent the total scatter. With the help of the ratios of these scatter components, we learned about the corresponding variance ratio distribution diagram, which is called F-distribution, according to its developer Fisher. And we understood that based on the F-distribution, the probability of the occurrence of a distribution ratio, simply called F-value, can be determined in the form of a P-value. And we then derived the P-value for the respective F-value from the graphic display. In our case the p-value was below the error probability of 
so that we correctly rejected the null hypothesis, and were able to give the smart board company management a recommendation for action, that we can assume with 95% probability, that at least two suppliers differ significantly, in their ball bearing outer diameters. We have also been able to determine, which suppliers is the supplier in question, by using the Fisher comparison test, with the corresponding grouping letters. So, that appropriate optimization measures should be initiated, by corresponding customer-supplier discussions, which should finally result in a uniform working instruction, in order to provide a very high degree of comparative precision between these three manufacturers. By the way, the three smartboard supplier names, John, Rodney, and Mullen, are a appreciation to Johnny Rodney Mullen, the founding father of street skating. Finally, we save our analysis results as a project by assigning our project the name One Way ANOVA under Save Project in order to close our project without losing any data.